Good afternoon and welcome to uh, FreightWave's Midday Market Update. I'm Michael Vincent. It is Tuesday, what is it, the 24th November of 24th. November. I'm joined with by <laughs> Zach Strickland today at the desk. How Hello. are you, Zach? Good, good, sir. Thank you for asking. Excellent, mm-hmm. excellent. As always, this is a, a live and interactive show, and we're on uh, LinkedIn, FreightWave's, and Facebook channel. So get your comments and your questions in, uh, and we'll get those uh, addressed as best we possibly can. we got a great show today. Uh, we've got Andrew Cox with the news and headlines. We've got some good Good uh, headline news there. Nick Austin with the weather, of course. Zach will be breaking down sonar in the markets today uh, from the desk with me, which is always fun. I won't have to go far. You won't have to go far. You will not have to go far. Anthony Smith, as always, with an economics update. And then we've got uh, Chris Richards, the international sales manager with Steam Logistics, will be on uh, talking uh, maritime and what's going on in that space. Uh, also, a couple headlines on that as well. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a very active uh, sector uh, for the maritime yeah, sector this year. It, it has, it has, <laughs> and then to follow that up with a very boring one, uh, air cargo. I don't know if I call <laughs> tongue it tongue in cheek. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Eric yeah. Coolidge, our uh, air cargo um, editor, uh, will be on uh, with us uh, also this this afternoon. So. Um, quite an exciting show, Zach. Yeah, yeah, we got a lot to cover today. We absolutely do. And uh, Andrew is ready, so let's go to Andrew with the headlines. Andrew, how are you doing today? What's in the news? I'm great, Michael. Good to be here. A week after General Motors CEO Mary Barra said that they would be ramping up the electrification of its fleet and rolling out 30 new all-electric models globally by the mid- mid-decade, GM now says that they will no longer support the Trump administration's battle to roll back California's fuel economy rules. Barra and GM are now aligning with California and with the Biden administration to address climate change by reducing automobile emissions. There's also a lot of market share considerations at play here. President-elect Biden recently said that he believes that the U.S. can own the 21st century car market by focusing on electric vehicles. Mari Barra responded with, GM and I couldn't agree more. Yeah, doesn't uh, doesn't the government own a lot of GM? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's possible. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's interesting to me that they've kind of, you know, one administration to the next, they kind of flipped. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, you know, hey, no doubt electrification of all class of vehicles is, is the future, right? And, I, it, not, and it's not a bad move aligning yourself with the, the current administration. No, not at all. I mean, you especially can, when they own part of you. Especially when they own part of it, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, urging others to get involved there as well. I mean, you can t- control the narrative a bit and get in with the legislation and have some have some influence there. No, it's I, I and, say it with a little snarky tone, but I'm not. I understand. I'm obviously, I have uh, met you before. In disagreement, yeah, <laughs> with, with what's going on here. Yeah, I mean, it, and obviously this suits their purpose. If they're going to develop cars uh, on the electric side of things and develop, or, you know, devote more resources and time and energy to that, uh, no loss here. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. Andrew, what else we got going on? So the next one is a funding round from autonomous trucking company Too Simple. Uh, Too Simple reportedly has raised about $350 million in a Series E closing round that should uh, finish closing by the end of the month, according to Forbes. Citing people familiar with the matter, Forbes said that the raise was led by automotive industry vet uh, Steve Gursky, who also is the CEO and co-chairman of Vector IQ, which is a company that did the reverse merger SPAC with Nikola. So uh, diving into another some of that freight tech um, freight tech funding here. And the round this, this round includes additional investment from current partners, including Navistar and Volkswagen. And according to the Forbes article, Too Simple also plans to sell shares via an IPO in the future rather than a SPAC. People had speculated that if Gursky was involved, maybe there would be another SPAC at play here, but they're saying that they're going to go the IPO route at some point. And Too Simple Simple is considered a leader in the autonomous trucking space, and the company has repeatedly said that it will have an autonomous truck, a fully autonomous truck, on the road in 2021. With this latest cash cash infusion, its largest to date, Too Simple has now raised over $600 million since launching in 2015. Yeah, and you know uh, they launched their uh, autonomous freight network, I believe, in in July with a hub yep. in in Dallas. Yep, and had uh, some of their other partnerships. I think from this year, uh, Nav- Navistar and Trenton Group and U.S. Express and Penske and uh, who else was there? McLean. The Berkshire yeah. Hathaway, McLean, the food distribution. Yeah, they've got a lot of investment and from a lot of key players, obviously some big movers in that list there. Um, you know, I'm always a little bit skeptical. I know that's a shock to you of, <sighs> yeah, of, of that things is weird. in terms of, you know, yeah, autonomous vehicles. They may have all the ability to do this, but they're going to need some government interaction at some point and some cooperation, I should say. 
uh, to get that fully autonomous level, which, you know, could tech obviously happen. The government, I think, will eventually step in here and get involved. But um, yeah, they're going to need to uh, get a little bit more interaction with the environment around them because you can't have an uh, autonomous vehicle without some sort of smart device infrastructure in place as well. Yeah, I would imagine that that would certainly help things. And some other some other ancillary or mm -hmm. not ancillary, but uh, other uh, vendors, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, in, in that space. Right. Because yeah. when you roll this out, you've got to be in this like controlled environment. Right. Yep. Uh, and and when you think of that, typically, I, I think of like a port all mm -hmm. right, or a rail yard or something like that. But. Long haul is also yeah. that way too, right? Well, they're they're tr they're specifically targeting long haul, right. I believe. Uh, you know, as the as the key primary you know length of haul that they're trying to uh, to solve. Because I think a lot of people have already figured out the short haul environment, the port, the drayage, yeah. providers getting very consistent routes, etc. The uh, once you get into that irregular routing and some of that more over the road, where you're having to go through different uh, environments, uh, without that informational feedback it makes it a lot more difficult. So I know they've got a ton of smart people there. I've talked to these guys before. So they, they, oh, yeah, absolutely. they, they definitely yeah, have the we've talent. We've had uh, their uh, president, uh, yeah. Cheng Lu, yeah. on before. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Very, very uh, smart people. They're going about it the right way. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got companies like uh, uh, Baton who would handle like the f final model. You know, they're positioning right. themselves to be that, uh, all right, autonomous long haul, and then we'll take care of it once it, you know? Right. No, that makes is, total sense, too, because, yeah. it's, you know, we kind of glaze over it, but there's two totally different functions there uh, that you have to solve for. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Andrew, what else we got in the headlines today? Next one is a bit of a sad story coming out of Jacksonville. The Coast Guard said last night that it had suspended a search for a man who had fallen off a tugboat near Blunt Island in Jacksonville, Florida, early Sunday morning. The Coast Guard said it received the notification about 3 a.m. Sunday from the tugboat named Pops that a 42-year-old man had fallen into the water while, transfer, while transferring to a barge and he had not resurfaced. The International Union of Operating Engineers on Facebook identified the man as Ozzy Martinez and said that he was transiting from the Gore Marine Transportation Tug Pops, his assigned vessel, to the Dredge New York when he went overboard. First Coast News said that a friend reported that Martinez was an experienced captain who had worked in the industry for many years, so it's very sad to hear this story. And people are on Facebook now reaching out to his family and seeing how they can help out. Yeah, that's tragic. <laughs> yeah, it is It is sad. And, and thoughts and prayers out to Ozzy's uh, family uh, in that situation, a tragic uh, accident. Yeah, I was actually watching uh, something on the Weather Channel this morning where there was a group of fishermen, uh, yeah. a small boat, uh, disappeared off the coast of, up there in uh, you know Massachusetts off the coast of Massachusetts uh, last night as well uh, as they had a lot of swells so yeah you, you just got to be careful out there and, and and Andrew I believe we've got a, a, a headline next that uh, has something a bit to do with with safety um, can you tell us about that yeah, safety or privacy, depending on who you ask. The federal regulators have granted J.J. Keller a five-year exemption that allows the company to mount its dash cam lower on the trucker's windshield despite driver concerns of obstructed views. The FMCSA determined that the lower placement of the company's advanced driver assistance system camera would not affect safety. The decision comes after uh, comes less than a month after the agency had approved a similar exemption to Samsara for its AI dash cam device. JJ Keller's request was supported by the National Private Truck Council and the Wisconsin Motor Carriers Association, as was the case in Samsara's application. However, many truck drivers, individual truck drivers, opposed the application, citing privacy issues and contending that mounting the dash cams lower on the windshield causes obstructed views. But the FMCSA maintained that granting the, granting the temporary exemption, which is effective today until t November 24th, 2025, will likely provide a level of safety that is at least equivalent to that achieved without the exemption. Yeah, the um, drivers were opposed. Uh, well, concern is it's in our sight, we'll get distracted by it, but also the, the notion that knowing they're being monitored That's the whole distracts thing. from them, yeah. right? Yeah. From being able to uh, focus on the road. Yeah, no, I, I think this is a well-documented uh, yeah. situation where drivers yeah. really don't want as much invasion into their space. You know, they're on the road a long periods of time by themselves. Uh, 
there's a reason that they chose this line of profession uh, and they do. Yeah. It. I mean, it's because they are, you know, not necessarily in contact with a lot of you know, the world, society, uh, you know, of their own choice. And when you start putting these devices and cameras and interactive tools, I mean, you, you remember the ELDs. Yeah. They don't want you to know where they are all the time. And it's it's not necessarily that they're doing anything wrong. They just don't like the sense of having somebody watching them, which I would understand that entirely. Yeah, absolutely. And we had that story uh, before, Andrew, that you, you, you had on the show about, uh, I believe it was Florida using, uh, were they using laser technology to see tailgating, et cetera, right? And in the, the video that we saw of it, you can see that... Y- did the car cut off the truck or did the truck pull up on the car? Who was at fault? And when you have this intense monitor, sometimes, uh, you know, the, even though you're seeing it, uh, you, there can be misinterpretation. Yeah. I exactly. mean, look at, look at instant replay. Yeah. No, we, that's why they, <laughs> they take their time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but as, as obviously as we grow with technology and, and things like that, privacy has become uh, obvious, a much more integrated piece of that discussion. Um, and that's the trade off. I mean, you're going to have, do you want to be more safe or do you want, but you're going to lose a little bit of your, you know, ability to be off the grid. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And Andrew, uh, we have a headline here from the world of maritime. I, I hear they're, they're hurting for, um, for profits. Yeah, just a little. We have another quarterly container line outlook or a quarterly report, and we have another big profit beat and another bullish outlook for the rest of the year. This time it's French carrier CMA CGM. They reported net income of $567 million for Q3, and get this, that's up 1,160% from $45 million this time last year. For the shipping division, EBITDA was $1.5 billion, up 76% year over year. And this is on volumes that are only up 1%, but the revenue per TEU, or 20-foot equivalent unit, was, uh, was $1,120, which is up 5.2% year over year. The company said fourth quarter maritime activity is more sustained during uh, more sustained now than during the third quarter due to ongoing increase in volumes. Thanks to the ongoing control of unit costs and the favorable demand environment, the group should see the group says that they should see further EBITDA margin growth into the fourth quarter. Jeffrey's analyst David Kirsten says the earnings upgrade cycle in the container shipping continues and that CMA CGM has confirmed the positive outlook that was previously voiced by both Maersk and Hapig Lloyd. No shock here. <laughs> yeah, no shock here. Yeah, they're doing they're doing quite well. And, and it's interesting, though, the bullish moving forward. I think that's the, you know, the ongoing sentiment from the maritime yeah. sector is because there's so much pent up demand. I mean, we're, we're talking about Absolutely. bottlenecks at this point. You know, we've talked to Greg Miller, uh, you know, they're shipping bottlenecks at the origin. They're shipping bottlenecks when they get to the ports here. I mean, we've got yeah. ships anchored out on the water. Our, even, even our maritime data reflected that as customs couldn't clear the uh, the, <laughs> the yeah, containers no, a- fast enough. Yeah, no, <laughs> you see in the reports of, you know, they're stacking them eight high and they have to move eight, nine, you know, 16 moves to get one container out for uh, at the port of L.A. and and so on. But we got some uh, Rhonda Bem- uh, Bompenza Zimmerman says, hello from a chilly Arizona uh, where it's 54 degrees this morning and highs of 70. And last week it was 98. So, uh, yeah. Uh, but on the sides of uh, autonomous vehicles, <laughs> we've got, you know, super cool to see how autonomous trucks are rolling out and taking different variables into consideration. Uh, from there, super cool to see this to self-driving is going to put a million drivers out of jobs. Um so yeah, that's I mean that's that's the concern. But I again, getting to straight up level four autonomy, we're still a long way away from that. Oh yeah, we <laughs> it's not going to happen are. overnight. Yeah, and <laughs> and I would I would hazard a guess that there's going to be some transition to other type of things. Like we, I mean, we've talked about it in the past. We become uh, engineers or pilots. Yeah, right. Uh, type of thing. Yeah, it, it all it does is just require a little bit. It's changing your training. You know, yeah. technology doesn't replace things altogether. We've we've grown our population. We've increased our technology yet we've expanded our uh, the job availability <laughs> it is it, it, it's kind of like that disruption between uh, uh disruption is a two-sided coin right but yeah. it's not disrupt or be disrupted it right. can be you can be on both sides of that coin and this is on a mass scale with drivers right yeah, yeah there's going to be those opportunities to switch gears a little bit in your career exactly so and it's not like all of a sudden there's going to be some sort of android sitting in the spot where you yeah. were <laughs> agreed agreed yeah. Let's uh, let's move on. We've got uh, Nick Austin ready to go with weather. Nick, what's going on with weather? 
Hey, gentlemen. Well, luckily that rough weather that, uh, up along the New England coast is gone, so it's a lot quieter today, but it's really, really messy from the Rockies all the way to the Great Lakes. From Denver to Chicago, we have areas of uh, heavy snow. We have some spots of freezing rain and sleet, and then uh, some areas where there's just rain mixing in there. So it's just really sloppy uh, across several states. So we'll take a look at it here in Sonar Critical Events. We've got the radar up there. And uh, out in the Denver area and the Rockies, that snow is going to start fading out later today. But uh, in the Denver metro area, along uh, areas of I-70, I-25 through that area, it's still going to remain uh, pretty messy uh, through the afternoon. Uh, but probably nothing that drivers can't handle there. Uh, but heading up to the Great Lakes in the Midwest, uh, lots of interstates impacted here. Uh, we're talking about kind of a mix of rain and snow from Chicago and the busy Joliet, Illinois market. Uh, up into uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, some of this heading towards Detroit through Milwaukee, maybe up towards Minneapolis, St. Paul a little bit later today. But the good news about this system is that temperatures are actually going to get warmer later today through this region. A warm front's headed through the region. So a lot of what you see, the snow and this uh, kind of sleet and freezing rain mix, is going to change almost all the rainfall across the Great Lakes later today and um, during the day uh, tomorrow. So uh, things are at least going to be improving there. Still going to be pretty messy and uh, drivers are just going to hit a lot of delays. But um, that's not all that's happening. Even though it's quiet in the northwestern United States, uh, we're going to see a new storm uh, heading there later today and through the nighttime. So we're going to see heavy snow. We're going to see uh, pretty gusty winds across the Cascades of Washington and Oregon. Uh, so Snoqualmie Pass, other areas of I-90. Uh, are going to see that heavy snow and possibly some low visibilities at times. That's starting again mainly this evening and then unfortunately lasting through the day on Wednesday, which is a big day for uh, maybe a lot of drivers that are going to be trying to get home for Thanksgiving uh, across this region. It's going to be pretty bad. Even in northeastern uh, Oregon in the Blue Mountains here, uh, where it's going to impact uh, some areas of Interstate 84 and then some of the high elevations there. So that'll really uh, kind of get cranking up later today, especially this evening, and then uh, lasting through the day Wednesday. There'll be more rain headed towards the East Coast probably later this week for Thanksgiving, maybe on Black Friday, as well as parts of the Southeast, which could see some heavy thunderstorms here and there. So just all kinds of messy weather, just in time for the holiday, unfortunately, yeah, in a lot of parts of the United States. So uh, just have to kind of slow down here and there and just take it easy. What kind of weather are we looking at here in Chattanooga, Nick? Well, it's going to be really nice on Thanksgiving today, <laughs> and quite mild. It's going to be almost 70 degrees <laughs> with lots of sunshine. So, yeah. you know, awesome. it's almost always 70 somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah, awesome. So, uh, Nick, you'll be back uh, at the uh, end of the hour here for a little update on, uh, what, on dry, uh, roads. Is that right? Yeah, we have an article up on the website uh, talking about some of the most dangerous roads for truckers across the United States. Uh, part one. I did uh, last month, this is part two, uh, where we list some more of those roads. A um, couple of them are uh, interstate uh, sections. Some, a couple of them are US routes. One of them is a state route out in California. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nick. Yeah. <clears throat> very, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's be safe out there. I mean, around the Great Lakes area with that weather is changing and going from, from rain to snow and you got the ice and you know, slick. You it's, know a little bit about that. I do. <laughs> I do. It's, uh, yeah, I can drive in snow. That's easy, but it doesn't matter how many wheel drive you got. If it's ice, you're in trouble. Yeah, we were driving our way up to Chicago last year and got to experience some of that fun. We did, yep. just about this time <laughs> yeah. of year, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. in the van. That yeah. was, we uh, went from rain to snow to ice. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was quite fun, yeah. especially in the middle of the night with no washer fluid and salt all over the yeah, windshield. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> I know a few tricks, right? Time yeah. it right, grab that windshield wiper and slap the, get the ice off. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> but hey, Zach, what's going on in, uh, in the freight markets? Yeah, so uh, something interesting that I noticed was we've seen, you know, throughout the year, we've seen a huge volatile swing in terms of freight volumes, yeah. tender rejection rates, obviously capacity getting super tight. Well, uh, one of the kind of byproducts of this is the fact that we've seen our average length of haul for the United States drop here since the start of November from near 640 miles to about 615 miles on average mm -hmm. for length of haul. That's actually a really significant drop. Uh, in an average, you know, for the entire United States. Uh, and it's because we're looking at the shift, of, a fundamental shift from, you know, the freight originating on the West Coast yeah. 
to the East Coast. You know, we've been talking about how the West Coast ports, obviously we just talked about CMA, uh, record profits, uh, et cetera. The, Los Angeles has been the most active market in the entire country uh, for the last bit. And that's not necessarily changing significantly, right? but we are starting to see a lot of that freight that's been entering the port start to now hit some of these markets like Atlanta, Harrisburg, uh, Chicago, obviously getting in on the game as well. So it's kind of that delay factor we've talked about mm -hmm. uh, before on freight forecasting and, and, and other shows where yeah. you see that long haul start to tick up. You can then expect to see the the domino effect into the the the, the short haul, the tweener, the city and that type of stuff. Exactly. And, and you can tell here in the chart that, you know, year over year, we're looking at we're looking at, you know, this big gap between last year and the year before, even 2018. Uh, this is a dramatic shift in the in the amount of freight or the type of freight that's moving in the United States, which obviously has helped contribute to the high rate of rejection that we've seen now up over 28 uh, yeah. percent. And we're nearing, you know, we were hitting record uh, re uh, tender rejection rates for reefer uh, earlier this week. Now we're starting to creep closer and closer to that record level for dry van as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what are you looking at going forward? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously, I think we're in that sweet spot of peak season right yeah. now where oh, we're yeah, going we to remain tight uh, throughout the rest of the year. I don't, obviously, I'm in line with the maritime guys. If they're telling me that they're going to be tight for the rest of the year. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and, I mean, well, and they're going to be tight for the rest of the year. And, and uh, you know, you talked to Steve Ferrara, mm -hmm. uh, you know, CEO at Ocean Audit and, and, and others, mm -hmm. and it, it's blowing right through Chinese New Year. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, think about it. The e-commerce, the e-commerce impact where people, they don't necessarily have to go get it and it doesn't have to be on the store shelf. It just has to be present online. I yeah. was looking at some random stuff the other day. You can't get anything. No. Like it's, it's gone again. <laughs> yeah. And so that just means that there's an order placed for it, that it's either sitting out on the water that that's going to take some time to overcome. So that means that, uh, you know, anybody moving freight here over the next two months is probably going to be very busy throughout the holiday season. Yeah. And it's yeah. interesting. You bring up that, you know, looking at stuff online and they don't have it. Right. Did right. you move on to see if somebody else had it? I did. Yeah, you did. And we were, we, you know, we were talking to Transfix yesterday mm -hmm. on, on, uh, on what the truck about, about those, about that situation, yeah. you know, and, and the consumer, you know, you, you've got to be ready. You have to have that insight into, into yeah. your inventory and what's going on because people move on very, very quickly. Um, but yeah. we've got, you know, the people are still uh, uh, talking about the driver situation. Paul Cameron, it takes a special breed to be a good trucker. And he's right. There are approximately 800,000 registered trucks in America talking about drivers being displaced mm -hmm. by uh, uh, automation. Um, Rhonda, Bambenza, uh, Zimmerman, maybe future drivers will be more accepting of these uh, tracking tactics, uh, but I can respect the driver's current concern into privacy. Andrew Bounds says uh, in response to 800,000 and the loss of drives, how many drivers is the industry short right now? And that's not going to change anytime soon. So automation can help relieve some of that stuff as well, right? As it, yeah. as it rolls it, out, it which is a great point. costs a little bit more to create these vehicles as well. <laughs> a, a tad. At, at right now. <laughs> a tad. A tad. But uh, next up, we've got our lead economist, Anthony Smith. Anthony, what's going on uh, in, in the economy right now that we can look at? Yeah, so right now we're going to be looking at or just talking about briefly the consumer conditions and overall one of Zach's favorite uh, consumer confidence. What we saw in the latest consumer confidence number was that there was indeed a tick down, um, down to around the 96 mark. So consumers are feeling it a little bit more. Um, this isn't too surprising after the latest jobless claims number for last week did show some increases. And so this is going to be one of the first significant increases uh, in quite some time in well over a month. So um, we're starting to see some increases in jobless claims. Consumer confidence is coming down and all just in time for the holiday season. Um, we also saw that retail sales over the last report for October did slow, although there was a month-to-month -month gain, and it's still up very strong on a year-over-year -year basis, but there is some slowing down in the economy as we're seeing some dried-up benefits come through, um, or lack thereof, and we're starting to see increases in cases. It's definitely weighing on the consumer psyche right now. Oh man, just tell me how they feel, Anthony. The, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is it is important though to know how they feel because that's I mean I think we've all figured out by now that the consumer with their feeling positive and upbeat about things they will go and spend that money and when yes, they're they feeling will. bad about things they'll go spend that money but maybe not as much of it. <laughs> 
Yeah, so you had a, a well, you still had growth. Yeah, it's right? still growth. There's still but month over month. Fast. It's just not growing as fast. I mean, right. in, on the consumer side. So right. I think that's that's important to note. But again, the stuff that they've ordered is still sitting out over the water. On the water. It, it, it is, and that, and Anthony, the 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 latest numbers were from October, correct? That's right. The latest numbers for October, and I think so. On my end, I'm expecting a little bit still slower growth going into November and December, as there's going to be a lack of any type of benefits pushed through. Um, not very likely that's going to happen before mid-January. Um, the other thing to note is like, although we're starting to see some ramp ups in certain subsectors and sub industries, so for manufacturing, things are closer to the consumer, like um, automotive vehicle parts or consumable durable goods that's gonna have a little bit more stronger uh, projection compared to all those that are in strictly upstream manufacturing like machinery goods and things like that, capital goods. Um, one of the things to note is that not all consumers are gonna be impacted the same way. So those that were able to maintain their employment and really kind of work remotely throughout this pandemic are gonna be feeling a little bit different than those that have may have been um, furloughed or laid off or things like that. So we're looking at the consumer conditions. I think that's also gonna be very dependent on different, uh, of course, industries. Um, just to kind of mirror that a little bit, when we look at the home purchasing sentiment index put out by Fannie Mae, is showing that um, a lot of those that are looking to buy are thinking that this is a great time to buy a home just because mortgage rates are so low and those that are feeling comfortable and their uh, job security are gonna be very actively looking for um, making those home purchases. So just like some of the subsectors in the macro economy, those consumers are also gonna be living, living in different vacuums right now. Yeah, they definitely are. I mean, everything boils down to Zach's favorite, the uh, you know, the, the consumer sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it all comes back. It all all roads lead to consumer sentiment in some way. I mean, you you can link those. I mean, yeah, I say it a little bit tongue in cheek, but my my question really is this: so the numbers were from October, right? And you're still looking at people who uh, feel pretty good about. Uh, uh, you know, home purchases because of Zach, as, as Anthony said, the, you know, the mortgage, the mortgage rates, rates are, are so low, right? So, so well. in October, now that we have a, a new administration and it, and it, it is a Democratic, mm -hmm. you know, is it uh, Biden? Does that change the consumer sentiment moving forward, positive or negative? I mean, with respect to those that may be influenced more heavily by the possibility of a stimulus or, or, or something. I don't know. I don't know if the change of power or the, you know, the party line influences the consumer as much as it does businesses. Yeah. Um, I think the well, consumer. I mean, it's a special year, right? You don't yeah. think it has. I, I, I mean, yeah, there's 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 sectors uh, that will be impacted by it. But I think the consumer is you know, more bound to, uh, you know, their jobs and their, what's right in front of them. Whereas the businesses are a little bit more concerned about the, you know, their tax rates and the incentives that they get from the government. Cause there, there's a lot of that there. Um, so I don't, I'm not necessarily super, I think the COVID cases being on the rise are what would potentially the next time Anthony comes on the show and talks about the consumer's, uh, feelings, I think they might be a little bit more negative, uh, based on the increase in cases. Yeah. So, um, Anthony, um, it's an interesting discussion. Is there any insight into a stimulus package? Is there any talk going on right now? Or is just kind of it, it stalled and now we're hoping that something will move forward now after the new administration takes office and kind of gels? Yeah, so I think uh, the late, the earliest we'll probably see any kind of stimulus is going to likely be in late January, second half of January, maybe early February. Um, unlikely that there's going to be anything passed over these next couple of months. Um, but yeah, when we're looking at overall consumer confidence, a lot of it's not only tied to jobs claims, but increasing in COVID cases. And those COVID cases increase overall job market. Um, so it's all really interconnected. Although um, when we're looking at overall consumer confidence, not exactly what I would look to as a leading indicator, but more so as an expl explanatory uh, indicator of showing why consumers are making the decision that they are or have been in the in the past couple of months. Um, but definitely the, the course of the economy isn't going to be set by one person individually. Um, when we're looking at economic studies in the past over the history of the U.S., no one president has really dictated whether or not we're going to the change of party is going to dictate whether we're going into a for, for sure recession or not. Um, more so looking at, you know, where, uh, you know, maybe a, a Republican or Democratic or controlled Senate or House or more local governments um, really kind of dictate more impactful what's going to happen in more consumers' day-to-day -day lives. But um, typically we're looking at historically 
economic movements. Um, if a recession's in the works, no one person or one party is going to be able to change that or kind of uplift that just because we're looking at such a huge economic machine here in the U.S. Yeah, I, I think I think that's pretty much spot on. Uh, the divided, um, you know, having a divided government too also offsets any real concerns about one party really pushing their agenda too far. Yeah, checks and balances. Kind yes. of. <laughs> Should have thought about that in the beginning. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much for that, Anthony. Uh, uh, and uh, I guess, uh, you know, later in the week we have uh, unemployment coming out. And yeah, we'll, we'll have get into that next week and see how that's how that's working, because that's a major effect on theirs as, as well. A couple, couple comments in here. Rhonda Bambensa Zimmerman is doing her mental break by running on a treadmill and waiting for a Christmas tree from Home Depot who can't tell her when it's going to deliver. So she's under a little bit of stress <laughs> there. Uh, but she comments, uh, you know, uh, lockdown again is bumming people out. Yep. Major COVID-19 fatigue. Andrew Bounds, uh, Director of Business Development. Uh, the Convergence of consumer confidence and consumer panic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, We're, uh, which is a, you know, a title for a book, I believe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think the COVID situation is going to, pun not intended, trump the uh, the election results. <laughs> very nice. Yeah. Very nice. So, uh, yeah, uh, very good topic so far. And right now we bring on a good friend of, of, of mine and ours here at, on the show of Chris Richards, who is international sales manager over at Steam Logistics, right down the road from here, actually. Yep. Chris, how are you doing today? Hey, how's it going, guys? Thanks for having me on. Hey, thanks for ha thanks for thanks for being here, my friend. So, uh, tell people a little bit about Steam, what you guys are doing over there, and uh, a little background on yourself. And let's jump into uh, maritime and some trans-Pacific rates. Yeah, so Steam Logistics is a logistics provider based out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, we started in 2012. Uh, our sole focus now is international logistics. Um, and with this crazy ocean market right now, it's been uh, very difficult and just being able to keep the freight moving. Um, and then as far as me, I've been an international sales manager at Steam Logistics uh, for about a year and a half now. Uh, I coordinate ocean and air import and export operations. Yeah, good stuff. So, Chris, uh, let's get right down to it. What's the trend in the Trans-Pacific uh, lanes right now? What are we looking at? Yeah, so I was on the show about two months ago, and the rates were at an all-time high for the year, uh, and I guess all-time uh, in general. Um, but they've remained steady since September 15th. Uh, so the carriers just announced that the rates are going to be the current ocean rates are going to be extended until 12:14. Uh, so typically, ocean rates are on a biweekly basis, um, but the carriers have now announced that the rates are extended until the 14th. Um, right now, we're seeing rates as high as 4,000 to the West Coast and 5,000 to the East Coast, which just to keep in mind, back in March before coronavirus, <laughs> it was around 13 to 1,500 to the West Coast and then about 25 to 28. So you're talking triple and double the cost uh, from what it was just months ago. That's as you were reading that, I was off camera. I'm looking at at, at Zach, just kind of cringing, going, "Holy mackerel!" I mean, <laughs> as you're reading off those numbers, because four thousand five—that's astronomical. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, it's not necessarily exactly like trucking, where the rates just kind of keep going up and up. The maritime tends to keep a little bit more boundary on things. Is that simply because they've increased the rates, like you said, uh, so much since the start of this whole thing? Yeah, so I think it's simply just because they can get away with it. So, um, you know, obviously the demand is there. So like you said earlier, I think you said CMA is up a thousand percent in their profit. So yeah. I think it you know, goes to show right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Doing... It's not like the ATA can come out and say, hey, uh, L.A. to Dallas is going to be $4.50 through December 15th. Yeah, no <laughs> way. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not going to fly. But, I mean, this is obviously supply and demand. So let, let's talk about the, the, uh, the space situation or the capacity situation that's going on. Can you speak to that a little bit? What are you seeing? Yeah, so the demand has obviously um, created a crazy situation with the space. So let's just say, for example, you're trying to book something, you know, today. Well, if you, the cargo is ready today, 
uh, specifically out of Qingdao, you can't even get a booking until the end of December. So, I mean, you're talking a month out, um, you know, three to four weeks out. So if I place the booking now, um, that's even subject to rolling. So none of this space is guaranteed unless you're paying these high premiums. Um, there's a major shortage of container equipment. There's way more, you know, going out of China than there is coming into China, uh, specifically for the high cube containers as well. Um, many customers are needing the high cube, so we're suggesting uh, different options, maybe split it up into a regular 20 foot or a regular uh, 40 foot container instead of doing the 40 foot high cube. Um, it, just any solution we can find in order to get the space reserved and get it moving because uh, we've been having a lot of stuff roll uh, recently and it just creates many issues with the customer and sometimes the customer will pay just a little bit more just to make sure that their stuff's going to stay moving. Yeah. So how much are they paying more? Like with these, are these surcharges on top of what they're already paying? Correct. Yeah. So let's say, for example, you have a 40 foot container going to Los Angeles. If it's $4,000 plus, let's say, for example, the steamship line is telling us, hey, uh, for example, HMM will say, hey, it's $600 per container. There's no guarantee on space or equipment. Or you could book with MSC and they're saying, hey, it's, you know, $4,000 plus, plus $1,200 to $1,500 and you are guaranteed space and equipment. So it's a gamble. Do you book with no premium and then maybe get rolled? Do you book with the smaller premium and then still get rolled? Or do you book with the maximum premium and then your stuff moves? So it really just depends on who's willing to pay more. Wow. And it really goes to show you need some experts like our friend Chris Richardson yeah, here oh to help gosh. you because I mean well, I mean you're talking you were talking earlier about some some little tricks of the trade, right? You can change the type of containers you're using to make them more attractive yep. to the to the ship for capacity, right? To help keep those things those things moving, right? Yeah, so we've been trying to switch it up. Like I said, for 45 high cubes, we're suggesting splitting it up into 40s and 20s. Um, we're um, suggesting to people to send the bookings anywhere from three to four weeks. And I know that sounds crazy when I tell my customers, hey, I need a booking schedule three to four weeks, but the rate's not going to be valid. I'll have to update you on the rate. It's kind of a difficult conversation to have, but once again, it goes back to that trust. So I've been staying up late at night, making sure that my partners in Asia are securing the bookings. They're uh, speaking with the shippers, releasing the shipper orders, pulling the containers from the Taiwanese and Chinese ports, securing that equipment. Because the quicker you can make the booking, the quicker you can pull the container, uh, you know, obviously you're going to be secured space. So that's, that's the name of the game right now is being the quickest. Yeah, that's, that's something else, man. So, you know, obviously you were talking about, we've got three to four weeks in advance that we're booking freight right now for coming over the water. Uh, what's the, is the, I guess the Q1 outlook has got to be pretty bullish, right? Right. So right now the demand is obviously still high. So if I'm getting a booking today, I'm trying to get space for as early in December as I can. Most ships aren't going to be leaving until the end of December. Uh, so then you're talking about when people are doing bookings in early December, they're not going to be leaving till January. Now, keep in mind, Chinese New Year is going to be on February 12th. I think the demand will continue on to Chinese New Year. And I actually think January is going to be even worse because people still have not been planning according to, you know, a, a month delay. So if your cargo is not going to be ready until December 20th, you may not even get space before Chinese New Year unless you're being proactive. Yeah, we've got. I mean, this is a pretty hot topic uh, in in the comments as 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 well, Chris and and Steve uh, Cranig, director of logistics at IMEX Global Incorporated. The steamship lines have maintained a discipline to keep capacity tight and rates high. Unfortunately, there is not another option that is turnkey. Customers will have to refocus on where they get their goods from. I.e., reshoring will continue to increase if that kind of crunch continues and you know speaking to that you know they've they've kept capacity tight it's not really a question of keeping capacity tight at this time and 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 anchoring vessels there's no more ships is that pretty much right 
Yeah, that's correct. So I think I saw something the other day where there was maybe nine or more container ships sitting outside of Los Angeles. I think you had mentioned it earlier in the show. Uh, you know, there's obviously a delay in customs. There's a delay at the ports in L.A. trying to get port appointments. Uh, it's overall been crazy from origin to destination port. Yeah, it's in, it's insane. And Steve follows up with, you know, most of the uh, most of the people on those ships that are sitting out there waiting and, and can't get off of those different, those different ports. They're they're, I mean, they're typically workers from other countries. I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, Southeast Asia, Indonesian and, and so on. But I mean, they're they're from all over. I mean, it's global trade, right? It's not just, you know, United States citizens. They're all over the place. But those people are, are stuck out there and the mental health has got to be taxing on them, I would think. Yeah. With well, all these type of delays. Right. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's a lot like the, I, not a lot like the cruise ship people that were stuck out in the water, but that's still, that's a lot. Cause they're already on the water at what, 12 to 14 days minimum. Uh, yeah. and then they're sitting out there for like another week or two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. To try and get into the port. And yeah. then when they're in the port, the, the, there's delays in unloading them because of the movement of all the capacity that's backed up, yeah. et cetera. And, uh, yeah, it's a disaster. Chris, I really, really appreciate you coming on the show and giving us that that update. We'll have you out again soon as we as we get closer to the end of the year and look into Q1. Uh, everybody's looking at that very bullishly. Can you give people uh, a little quick uh, where they reach out to you and how they learn more about Steam Logistics and, and get some of that insider uh, knowledge on how to uh, change up their capacity uh, to get things moving? Yeah, so you can uh, visit us at steamlogistics.com. I'm posting all my updates on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Chris Richards, Steam Logistics, so you can find me on there. Um, I'll continue to post updates on there, and then you can reach me on my email address at chris.richards at steamlogistics.com. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. You have a great, uh, a great Thanksgiving, my friend. Thank you, guys. You too. Right on. Thanks, Chris. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I'm constantly trying to figure out how that's going to, like, continue. Because think about it. We're, we're talking about freight that's coming into the country that they ordered months ago. Yeah. Does that demand dry up? I mean, does, does it, do we see cancellations and, and things like that, that that start piling up here at the end of the year? Uh, it's probably fairly hard to cancel it once it's on a ship. <laughs> no, no, no. From that aspect, but the end but, user. Uh, oh, yeah, the end <laughs> user. Yeah, how many companies are going to be caught with their, you know, the stuff being canceled because they're outside their limits of service, and that's probably one of the things that you know Amazon was looking at when in rethinking or repartnering with some of their uh, their last mile vendors and and shippers, you know, maintaining that they have to meet their stringent standards in what is considered on time. Same with Walmart, right? Yeah. Uh, because they've got orders and they've got inventory and so on, and you can't risk that stuff being, being uh, canceled because it's outside of some parameter that's in your fine print that says you can cancel if I don't make this or whatever, right? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's... that's um, that's a that's a really solid point. I also thought it was really interesting that, you know, you on, on Freight Waves Now this morning mm -hmm. said if you're looking to book capacity and you're just getting ready now between now and the end of this week, good, it's not going to happen. Just <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and, I mean, and pretty much Chris just said, if you're looking to book capacity between now and December 15th, forget about it. <laughs> not maritime, right? It's the same thing. Yeah. It but is. I, I'm, I'm always curious to know about other modes and, uh, you know. Oh, air, that's a good point. <laughs> air, air cargo, uh, they've, they've been a little, they've, they figured out a way to manage through this uh, by switching a bunch of passenger flights, but we're still seeing constricted capacity. Is that we right? We are. You know, I've got somebody who can help us out with that and he happens to be on right now. Eric Coolidge, our air cargo editor. How are you doing, Eric? Oh, doing great, guys. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, looking good. I was I was uh, talking to uh, uh, Eric when we were testing earlier, and he he uh, had to go shave and and shower uh, before the show. Um, oh, I, don't, I didn't shave, that's for sure. But... <laughs> well, maybe. Uh, but uh, so, Eric, uh, what's going on here in in Air Cargo? There's some interesting things going on. I saw your thing on uh, the the Cuba <laughs> situation, which is actually a little thing, but it was it was it was a it was a good headline. What's going on? Well, just to uh, tie a bow on what you guys were just saying about yeah. the uh, you know the air cargo market overall, um, you know there's still you know severe capacity shortages. Um, you know air cargo volumes are you know improved a lot from the beginning of the pandemic, but there's they're still down maybe 10 percent or so from a year ago. But there's still such a um, 
shortage of capacity because of all the passenger planes that are out of the market. And even though freighter, you know, airlines or all cargo airlines have thrown in more freighters. And as you said, passenger airlines have put in about 2,500 or more planes in cargo only mode. There's mm -hmm. still like a, a quarter, you know, 25% shortage in capacity. So, you know, this is a really instructive stat, you know, volumes down 10 or 12%, but yet for the industry, revenues up like 16% and yields are up about 42%, at least through September, October. So you can just imagine, you know, those are the types of premiums that they're commanding at the moment. Do you think that we're going to see some sort of like permanent transition to uh, some of these passenger, some of this passenger capacity, especially as we're seeing, you know, people will stay off the passenger jets for a little bit longer, uh, more than likely. Do you think that we're going to see some of this more permanent change into a, a freighter versus a passenger jet? Um, you know, so there, um, most of the airlines don't seem to want to take on freighters. It's a, it's a big risk. It's a, you know, they want to be more asset light and, you know, the freight market is typically very volatile. So you go through these feast or famine periods. And so, um, you know, most don't seem interested in like getting into full, you know, main deck freighters. Um, but I reported on someone last week, oh, Air Canada, Mm -hmm. I reported on recently, they're exploring, they're looking into the idea of maybe getting some converted passenger planes, converted freighters and operating one or two. Um, it's still a little speculative. They haven't quite finalized on that, but they're, they're looking at it. They, they're very innovative companies. So that's, that's the first sign I've seen of that, but um, we'll have to see, but these passenger freighters um, where they either put the most of the cargo in the bottom, like they normally do, and sometimes they put them, um, they're getting more creative and putting them in the seats of the planes and strapping them in. Um, or in some cases, a few cases, removing all the seats to have more floor space with light cargo. Those seem to be, you know, those are going to last through the year, probably into next year, you know, as demand uh, continues and PPE shipments continue. And so we'll just have to see how long that lasts, you know, kind of depends also on how much when the passenger market starts to come back and they want some of some of those planes back for that purpose. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, you, let's talk about your article about uh, Alaska Air, because this this may give some insight into what what uh, the airlines are, are thinking, right? I mean, looking at more efficient and greater capacity uh, for for cargo uh, on, on, on their planes, right. right? Instead of going full freighter mode mm -hmm. uh, and more efficient. Can you talk to that and what they're doing there with the 737 MAX? So, yeah, there's a couple things, uh, Alaska Air developments in the past week. Um, so along the lines of, of the cargo only planes, they just started um, last in the last few weeks um, putting cargo in the cabin with these special, what they call seat bags, these big zippered bags that they can tie into the seats and then they can put boxes in there and secure them. And, you know, the it's easier to put the... Um, to strap everything in that way, it's safer. So there was a Chinese uh, engineering company that they used. It's the first time in the U.S. Uh, using these seat bags. So it increases a little more efficiency if they're putting cargo in the cabin. But um, more interestingly, from a financial standpoint, yesterday Alaska made a pretty big deal in um, leasing. Uh, they're going to lease 13 new 737 uh, Boeing uh, 737 MAX uh, jets. And as you know from the news, the FAA last week uh, recertified the MAX after 20 months of being grounded after, you know, two fatal accidents. And, you know, Boeing finally made a bunch of fixes to its software system and other upgrades to, to convince regulators that it's safe to fly now. So um, airlines are, you know, eager to get those planes going again, although demand is very light right now, but they're more efficient planes. So what happened yesterday was um, Alaska is gonna lease uh, from a big leasing company, uh, 13 of these planes, and they're gonna get rid of about 10 Airbus A320s that they had. These are narrow body planes because they're old, a little older and less efficient. And, and, I th and then they're gonna lease so they're going to sell those planes back to the leasing company 
make about $270 million, pay off some debt, then they're going to lease those Airbuses back for about a year until those 737 Maxes come into their system from Boeing or from, you know, via the leasing company. So it's kind of an interesting transaction. But the final point I'll make is that it's, it's instructive that Alaska is taking advantage of the market. These, these leasing companies have so many planes on their hands and Air Lease Corporation has a lot of orders from Boeing so they can get these planes at a discounted rate than normal. So they're like, their balance sheet's in pretty decent shape. They're like, let's get some of these more efficient planes, get rid of the older ones, and we'll be ready to roll when passenger business starts picking up. Oh, that's a brilliant play. I mean, especially since you can throw it into variable cost and get it at a discount, and you're basically naturally adapting to the current environment. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, because these are they're due to come online, I think, at the end of next year and into mm-hmm. into uh, 22 and 23. Right. right. Uh, and, you know, 600 miles, they fly 600 miles further. They're 20 percent more efficient on, on fuel. Uh, your max cargo goes up and also the passenger seat. So it's a strong play. Yeah. And like you said, you get it on a variable cost and uh, it's, it's pretty sweet. What are we looking at real quick, uh, Eric, in the COVID vaccine distribution and how its effect on uh, uh, air cargo? Yeah. Um, as you know, there's a lot of um, there's uh, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine are, are going to the uh, FDA for uh, re- approval real soon. And there's a couple other uh, promising vaccines in the pipeline from Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca. And uh, all those vaccines have different temperature variables. So lots of challenges for the uh, supply chain. Um, uh, the Defense Department, Operation Warp Speed is, is in planning carefully and rehearsing all kinds of distribution scenarios with the states and jurisdictions and the logistics sector. Um, and air cargo will be a you know pretty big piece of that. Although how much it is in the U.S. is is unclear. A lot of it will be handled by trucking, but you yeah. know shipping globally will be a lot of air. And um, and you know people are trying to invest in in more cold chain infrastructure. So uh, the, the the vaccines that are lower temperature will be helpful, especially in you know less developed countries where there isn't as much infrastructure. Then they don't have to worry about these super ultra cold uh, freezers and so forth. Yeah. Can you uh, so Eric, we got about a minute or so uh left, but uh can you give us a little bit of the uh forecast as we're looking at, you know, boring Boeing air air freight not boring, the Boeing air freight and freighter forecast over, you know, can you give us a little forecast on that? Yeah, uh definitely not boring. Um No, it's Boeing not anything last- but anything but. <laughs> yeah, um last week Boeing uh they put out a biennial air cargo or air freight forecast. And it was interesting last week, they, they put out their 2040 kind of outlook. And, you know, it was pretty promising for freighters in the air freight market, but it was, you know, looking at, I went back and looked at the 2018 numbers and uh, they were slightly down, you know, compound annual growth of the air freight traffic is about 4% versus 4.2 and about 2,400 freighters. Uh, they expect, uh, you know, from growth and replacement um, that'll be needed by then, which is down about 200 planes. But the reasoning for some of that is, you know, efficiency, you know, so it looks on the one side like there's less demand, but part of it is due to more efficiency. The the air cargo companies can, uh, I figured out how to utilize or fit more cargo in the planes just through better procedures. Mm -hmm. And some of the freighters that they're, um, uh, some of the, 60% of those planes will be passenger conversions. And so a lot with, with, so with the pandemic, so many planes are getting put on ice that are younger. So these younger planes can be worked harder and more frequently so they can get more cargo on them. So they don't need quite as many aircraft. Uh, very interesting. Good insights. Mm-hmm. And thank you so much for that, Eric. Uh, and uh, you have a great uh, Thanksgiving, my friend. And for everybody out there, catch Eric, uh, his uh, stories and and more on, on FreightWaves.com and AmericanShipper.com. And Eric, how do people reach out to you if they've got an interesting story or just want to say hey? Yeah, um, I'm on Twitter at, at Eric Reports. And um, my email is e. Coolish, K-U-L-I-S-C-H, at FreightWaves.com, also on LinkedIn. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eric. Good stuff, Eric. Have a good All Thanksgiving. Right, take care, guys. Man, 
Yeah, not boring. No. That was a <laughs> <laughs> boring. <laughs> that not was at just all. me not being able to speak is 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 what that was. <laughs> that, uh, that that Ohio slang. <laughs> yeah. So let's uh let's move. We got Nick Austin back yeah. and we're going to talk about dangerous roads for truckers. Uh Nick, what do we got? Uh, there are plenty of those out there. Before we get into that, I want to give a quick shout out to DV Logan watching the show from Chicago where DV says it's damp and it's chilly which is absolutely true, but at least it's gonna stay warm enough to keep the snow and the ice away with this storm. So that's the good news for the Chicago area, the Joliet market, which is a big freight market up there. Uh, but talking about some of the most dangerous roads, this is part two. The article is up on our website, freightwaves.com right now. And if you just look at some of the nicknames that people have given to some of these dangerous roads uh, that are really bad for truckers, um, Blood Alley, the Killway, Tail of the Dragon, you get a sense that these roads are just not designed very well. They have a lot of switchbacks. Uh, there may not be a lot of safety features. And if you add bad weather, it just makes everything worse. Uh, so any drivers that have to, uh, that do decide to use those roads, they just have to take it extra slow. Uh, a couple of them are in California. There's one uh, down in our part of the country in uh, Eastern Tennessee and Western North Carolina. Uh, so go check that out on the website. Uh, lots of interesting information there on some of those uh, dangerous roads for the drivers out there. Yeah, absolutely. I've been uh, on I've, the Dragon's Tail before. I've been on the yeah. Dragon's Tail before, but uh, so growing up in Cleveland, it was Dead Man's Curve. Okay. Right? <laughs> Five-lane highway going directly into downtown with a little over 100-degree uh, turn to the left. <laughs> Yikes. How yeah. does that even... Oh, man. <laughs> right up to Cleveland Stadium. It was right right there by Burke's Lakefront Airport, but yeah, Dead Man's Curve. Thanks for that, Nick. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, you know, Chicago weather. <laughs> You know yeah. what it's supposed to be this time of year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that sounds like uh, everybody's going to be dipping their toe in Lake Michigan, actually. 65 yeah. degrees. The polar Bear Club. <laughs> the Polar Bear Club. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, man. So uh, what have you got coming up? So, you know, we've got great quarter guys today. Here's Sweet. two, which Andrew Cox and Seth Holm will be there to cover that. I don't know specifically what the topic, but they always do a good job. But personally, me and Anthony, Anthony Smith yeah. and I have Freightonomics tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern. We're going to have Will Sested. Will Sested. Uh, you know, he manages our association and university relationships here at Freightways. We're going to be talking a little bit about some of those government regulations and see what's on the agenda upcoming. Ooh. We've got a lot. That's a big hot button topic, obviously, today. <laughs> yeah, it's always a hot button yeah. with me. You know, <laughs> you know my fear. More regulation, please. Yeah. No. <laughs> Not so much. But that's it for me. What about you? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, we've, we'll have we'll have what the truck on Friday. But, uh, you know, yesterday we went through uh, reefer rates, obviously through the roof, some $5.20 uh, cent lanes. And talking about how it's, it's kind of crazy to look at $4.50 and think it's a bargain. And, uh, <laughs> reefer, <laughs> reefer madness. <laughs> reefer, it is reefer, <laughs> reefer madness. We went through uh, uh, holiday buying uh, trends and uh, drivers, you know, point of view, life on the road and stuff like that. We even went through uh, Swing Hinge. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had a picture of it. What the a, whole thing. I was working on that all spring. Man. <laughs> I know it's the fall, but it, it was it was done in the spring. I just sent everything. And you can catch those news and, uh, you know, the news and shows live at noon on Eastern Time, Mondays and mm -hmm. Fridays uh, for What the Truck on Freightways TV, Freightways LinkedIn, Facebook, or on demand by looking up What the Truck on every or on any of your favorite podcast players. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the What the Truck newsletter, freightwaves.com forward slash WT. T uh, to get that. I love the What the Truck newsletter. It, it's like, <laughs> pretty excellent, isn't it? You know, and I'm not just saying that because I work here and I know you guys, but that thing is, I even had to tell Diener, I was like, man, that, that thing is... I, I love it. Like it's it's such a like it, it fits my attention span perfectly because I have none. <laughs> no, it, it, it is excellent, and I and I have to admit, you know, very humbly, I got nothing to do with it. <laughs> it's, it Dooner, Dooner's yeah. kicking it, man. And, mm -hmm. You know, next week we've got uh, space space waves coming up. Space waves, learn about space and freight. Yeah, Mark Mark Weiss, NASA, gonna be uh, on some talking that, about some of that stuff. Like I've I've actually you know at first I was kind of like cha, and then I kind of learned about it a little bit and there's it's a, there's a ton of fascinating stuff going on there oh yeah a absolutely it is you don't absolutely know what you don't you gotta, know 
song. <laughs> Got to check that thing out next next uh, next Thursday. Uh, you know, free to register. Go and yep. register at live.freightwaves.com yep. uh, and get in there. Uh, and you can find all the Freightways shows on demand on Freightways TV app or on your favorite podcast player. Simply uh, subscribe to Freightcast and get every single Freightways podcast on all on one feed. The feed is also exclusive audio home to the Midday Market Update. Peace and love, everybody. Thanks for being here, Zach.